I am Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thor, king under the mountain. I return, cried Thorin. All leapt to their feet. The master of the town sprang from his great chair. But none rose in greater surprise than the raft men of the elves who were sitting at the lower end of the hall. Pressing forward before the master's table, they cried, These are prisoners of our king that have escaped, wandering vagabond dwarves that could not give any good account of themselves, sneaking through the woods and molesting people. Is this true? asked the master. It is true that we were wrongfully waylaid by the elven king and imprisoned without cause as we journeyed back to our own land, answered Thorin. But lock nor bar may hinder the homecoming spoken of old. Nor is this town in the wood elves' realm. I speak to the master of the town of the men of lake, not to the raft men of the king. Then the master hesitated and looked from one to the other. People were shouting inside the hall and outside it. The keys were thronged with hurrying feet. Some began to sing snatches of old songs concerning the return of the king under the mountain. That it was Thor's grandson, not Thor himself that had come back, did not bother them at all. Others took up the song, and it rolled loud and high over the lake. The king beneath the mountains, the king of carven stone, the lord of silver fountains, shall come into his own. The woods shall wave on mountains, and grass beneath the sun, his wealth shall flow in fountains, and the rivers golden run. The stream shall run in gladness, the lake shall shine and burn. All sorrow, fail, and sadness at the mountain king's return. The master saw there was nothing else for it but to obey the general clamor, for the moment at any rate, and to pretend to believe that Thorin was what he said. So he gave up to him his own great chair. Soon afterwards, the other dwarves were brought into the town amid scenes of astonishing enthusiasm. Thorin looked and walked as if his kingdom was already regained, and Smaug chopped up into little pieces. The dwarves' good feeling towards the little hobbit grew stronger every day. There were no more groans or grumbles. They drank his health, and they patted him on the back, and they made a great fuss of him, which was just as well, for he was not feeling particularly cheerful. He had not forgotten the look of the mountain, nor the thought of the dragon. At the end of a fortnight, Thorin began to think of departure. Then for the first time, the master was surprised and a little frightened, and he wondered if Thorin was, after all, really a descendant of the old kings. He had never thought that the dwarfs would actually dare to approach Smaug, but believed they were frauds who would sooner or later be discovered and turned out. Let them go and bother Smaug, and see how he welcomes them, he thought. Certainly, O Thorin Thrain's son, Thor's son, was what he said. You must claim your own. What help we can offer shall be yours, and we trust to your gratitude when your kingdom is regained. Although autumn was now getting far on, and winds were cold, and leaves were falling fast. Three large boats left Lake Town, laden with rowers, dwarves, Mr. Baggins, and many provisions. The master and his councillors bade them farewell. People sang on the keys. The white oars dipped and splashed, and off they went on the last stage of their journey. The only person thoroughly unhappy was Bilbo.